Hey YouTube, it's JP Dylan. Today we're looking at this very bizarre little 1960s Elgin watch company 12 transistor AM FM clock radio. Just to uh, give you an idea what the size of this is, there's a bottle of alcohol. That's a, a tiny, tiny little clock radio. I picked this up at a thrift shop. Uh, price was right. Owner claims he couldn't get it to work. So uh, I'm kind of intrigued by it. Another thing of it is it's heavy. This thing weighs like about eight pounds. You could probably kill someone with it if you uh, smashed them hard enough. Oops, shouldn't have said that. Anyway, um, let's plug it in and see if the little clock works. Let's see if the radio works. I haven't done anything to this yet. Well, the clock is turning. That's good. And let's switch over here to on. There's something. A hum. That's about all you get though. There's something. So that should mean, in theory, the FM should work. Let's see, it's got a little whip antenna here. That pulling that up does anything. my test generator. NSFM sensitivity is pretty much nil above 100 megahertz. There's just nothing. I should be getting at least another five or six stations. Yeah. So that's, yeah, kind of yucky. Well, let's open it up and see what happens. So it looks like getting inside of this is not all that tricky. Um, Blah, 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 transistorized, no authorized service personnel. Elgin Radio Division, National Watch Company. So I'm going to assume that if we take these screws out, we'll just be able to slide this thing out of the case. At least that's the assumption. That one doesn't really want to come out at all. like there's a retaining nut or something where the uh, threads are stripped out. Someone's already removed that screw, so I'm kind of worried about that. Who was inside last? That's always the question I have to wonder. People really get overzealous with fixing things, and oftentimes, like that screw there, did I loosen that one already? I don't think so. My greatest fear is not being able to find the tone knob. Because that's got to be a, one of those weird knobs that only this thing would have. Yeah, I think this is stripped out. It just keeps turning and it's kind of bent like somebody forced it out of the case. Uh, I'm going to have to put the camera down momentarily to get that screw out. Okay, well that's a start. The chassis hasn't let go yet. And I'm still having trouble getting this out. Also, I'll have to re-glue that piece that came off. It was just kind of floating around inside of here. It does seem, though, that the clock portion of it comes apart separate from the uh, radio. In fact, I think if I undo the earphone jack there, then we'll be able to better get at this. But looking down inside of there, it looks like that's the remaining chassis that we need to loosen that screw to get out. Yeah, it's pretty badly stripped, so I may just use a self-tapper to get that in there. All right, so once you get the stripped screw out, you can get the chassis out. And let's flip this over here so we can better see. Looks like your basic 1960s Japanese transistor radio. Let's 
hook it up here, the little speaker comes out. Uh, blistering 0.3 watts rated. And you can see all those tiny little cute IF transformers in there. And we'll have to find out why the FM sensitivity is so poor. Because with a big old whip antenna like this had, it should do something. And the whip antenna, I'm guessing, attaches here because that would then press against that bracket back there. And then this thing fell out the cabinet too. It's stuck out the back. I'm guessing it's a cord holder of some kind or antenna holder. More stuff to reattach. And then these tiny, tiny little potentiometers. So small. Look at that. Look at how tiny that is. Tiny things were really not of this era yet, so this is was probably an expensive thing, if you think about it. The non-fun part about this is going to be troubleshooting it, because as you can see, without pulling that board up, there's limited room. But if you pull the board up, then what happens is that you've got to destring the radio, which is not very fun. So, the fact that, uh, I keep shifting the camera, the fact that the FM upper band is pretty dead, that could be an alignment problem, that could be an IF problem, that could be an oscillator problem, that could be a whole bunch of stuff. So it'll be, I'll be curious to see what it actually is when we get to it. I gotta keep remembering that in order to access the portion of it that I want to see, I gotta turn it upside down. Kind of a neat little thing. So this is the antenna here. I wonder what happens if we just attach a bare lead to it. Okay, so just with the bare lead attached, there's a noticeable difference. <laughs> All my higher band is there now. So I think what's going on is that that antenna contact um, back there just isn't making contact anymore. I don't think the radio itself is at fault with that one. I think it's just this uh, little spring contact back here isn't touching the uh, little bracket that attaches to the whip antenna. So this may be something fairly straightforward. We can just clean it up, do a minor tweak on it, and then bend this uh, tab out a little bit so that it touches that. And then we should, in theory, have pretty good reception. And then just obviously reattach the little things that fell off. I like to use this uh, Evil Glue. This is Springfield Speaker Repairs Professional Adhesive. And it works great for speakers, but also for reattaching things because it doesn't really require that you use a large amount. Like maybe two little tiny pin drops or three pin drops will hold this thing to the front panel without a problem. So, uh, cool. I guess there's not going to be a whole lot to do on this one. So what I'm going to do, we're going to get our handy little can of Deoxid D5. And I'm going to turn the pressure down here so we don't blast it all over everything. And just uh, spritz a little. A little vent holes up top. I noticed something about these little early transistor Japanese sets. is They always have a 5K volume control. It's almost always 5K. It's not like 50K or 100K or any of that. It's almost always 5. Like 5 is the magic number. Let's use 5. Just something I observed. So we'll just work these a little bit. And then, of course, there's the band switch, which is down in here, which is very touchy. work this a bunch. 
I just have an affinity for weird old things. The dead spider's been there a while. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and turn this back on again. Wakey, wakey. What do you do if you know is a child sex trafficker? Well, I don't know. Ask Jeffrey Epstein. Okay. An American Chewy reference. All right, we're off to a winning start here. Now, what's changed? I was very proud of the program Let's yesterday. But we're this sticking. Is nope. Today. There we go. Thanks. And find the cases of more you can contact with us. And then... I do notice a little bit of hum. Lovely. Got a lack of filtering there. What do they use for filter capacitors on this thing? Probably something primitive. 470 microfarads, maybe a thousand. Trying to grip this little thing. Not easy. 200 microfarad, probably another hundred. These guys here, we need to change all them out. Single wave rectification, too. Let's see, just peeling this up. I bet you if we test those, those are dead, or near dead. All right, so I'm going to try to finagle my ESR meter on here while I'm holding the camera. Yep, dead. Let's look at this one here. Also dead. And let's see about this one here. We can get the little probes on there. That one's still partly alive. So out of the three filters here, only one is doing its job, and that's why we're getting the disgusting 60 cycles on top of everything. Thankfully, these are not weird values. So I think what I'm going to do is change these uh, filter caps. And then uh, maybe put a drop or oil or two on these tuner pulleys in the main tuner flywheel. Because it is a little difficult to tune. Granted, it's a small diameter shaft and I got fat fingers, but uh, it shouldn't stick in places. And then, of course, we'll reattach the little dial thingy there. So, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly swap those out. And then uh, we'll see what its performance is afterwards. All right, so we got our new capacitors soldered in here. Let's see if this thing uh, behaves any differently. I don't know if it will or not, we'll find out. Well, let's hum anyway. Let me get one of the knobs. Sure is behaving strangely, especially with that uh, detector. What's with that? Like fade in, fade out stuff. Does it on both AM and FM? Interesting. Uh, so go figure. It stopped doing it after I went and grabbed a meter. This thing doesn't run on very much voltage. Six and a half volts. Nine volts. 
8 volts. Still got that annoying hum there though. Uh, let me get the phone. All right, so so far so good. Uh, it's was misbehaving momentarily, but now it's kind of doing its thing. So I'm actually I'm thinking of just putting it back in the cabinet and playing with it for a little while. And we do need to work on that antenna thing a little bit. Alright, we're after a little quick tweak on the IF. It's doing pretty good now. Got everything on the high band. All right, so let's button this one back up. I think this one's ready to go. All right, so here she is all back together. And now our antenna works too. Let me uh, pull this out here. It's actually a pretty big whip antenna for a little clock radio. Reception's pretty hot now. Anyway, there we go. So it's back and working again with a couple new caps and a little tweaking. Uh, I'll have to look around for a knob that might fit that thing. Because that's the only thing that bothers me is the knob's missing. Wish it wasn't, but oh well. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Uh, more stuff to come in the future. Bonus footage. So I found a knob that's about the right size, but as you can see, it's got a threaded insert. So here's a little trick you can do. I got a piece of shrink tubing and I put it in between. You see that? How it's down there. I've got it slid over one half of the shaft, not both, just one half. This acts as a grip. And so with the threaded piece, I let the knob create threads on the heat shrink tubing. And as you can see, the heat shrink is gripping the knob. You may have to do multiple layers of heat shrink in order to get it to grab. This one was just one. And you tighten it down until you see it the way you want it. And then, since it's a fairly firm grip, you can see now that I have complete use of that knob. And if we plug it in here and turn it on, organization and it says there's a 20 percent chance that we'll see a temperature increase pretty nifty huh so uh thankfully i found that it's not perfect but it's better than nothing so just a little trick for you kids to uh use next time you need to get a funny knob to fit on a uh, non-threaded shaft